Michigan's Children proudly presents Speaking for Kids, the podcast where we explore crucial conversations impacting the lives of all Michigan children, youth, and families, especially the most vulnerable. Join us each month as we explore public policies and issues in the best interest of our kids and families. We'll bring you lawmakers and policymakers, advocates fighting for change, and the people most affected by those decisions. With our host, Matt Gillard, President and CEO of Michigan's Children, we'll invite you to become engaged too and show you how to take action on what matters most to you. Episodes are recorded live and shared virtually on YouTube and the audio hosting sites, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Hello, and welcome to Speaking for Kids, the podcast from Michigan's Children. I'm your host, Matt Gillard, the president and CEO of Michigan's Children. Today, we welcome three top advocates to talk about some of the big wins for children, youth, and families in the newly adopted fiscal year 2024 state budget, which will actually begin this fall on October 1st and run through September of of 2024. In just a few minutes, you'll hear from our guest, Patrick Brown, the executive director of the Michigan Adult Community and Alternative Education Association, Ben Moe, president of the Michigan Network for Youth and Families, and Aaron Skeen Pratt, Executive Director of the Michigan After School Partnership. For your background information, administrative and legislative work and negotiations toward this fiscal year 2024 budget plan has really consumed state government and the legislature over about the past five months, um, at least. And and really now we're happy to talk about some of the key outcomes. And these include the unprecedented improvements, uh, such as the historic increase of five million, a little over $5 million for services for runaway and homeless youth, a $10 million boost for adult education and literacy, and $50 million more for after school program. And as excited as we are to talk about these big wins, and we'll get into that conversation in a minute, the, the curmudgeon and me can't paint all the budget news with, with rainbows and unicorns. Uh, we also notice, note that there are some real missed opportunities from the legislature and the governor in this budget round, but we'll, uh, we'll uh, save that topic and those discussions for another day. Uh, and that's why us as advocates and our work as, as advocacy organizations is never done. But for today, let's focus on the positive. And so let me begin um, by giving our guests an opportunity to introduce themselves. So Erin, why don't you start quickly and just introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And I'm Aaron Skeen Pratt, Executive Director at Michigan After School Partnership. And we are a coalition, or as we like to say, a movement that is working to ensure that all youth someday have equitable access to quality before school, after school, and summer programs. And so the way we do that is through policy, through training, technical assistance, through research, and networking and relationship building. Great. Ben, how about you? Hi, I'm Ben Mo. I am the president of the Michigan Network for Youth and Families, and we are a member organization of programs across the state of Michigan. We have 19 currently uh, providers that provide services to runaway and homeless youth in various capacities using shelter, transitional housing, and outreach-based models. Great. Patrick? Hi, Matt. Uh, I'm Patrick Brown, Executive Director at McKay, the Michigan Adult Community and Alternative Education Association. And like um, Ben and Aaron's organizations, we are a statewide organization with uh, nearly 500 members spread across 130 different agencies, um, really representing before and after school enrichment programming all the way through youth um, flexible learning and all the way to adult skill building. So we really serve as that body for professional development, the sharing of best practices, policy research, and advocacy support for all of those individuals. And we're very excited to talk today about the budget. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. And let's jump right into it. Let's talk about the good news and really how uh, maybe some of the folks that you work with on a daily basis that, that, you know, have not experienced uh, such positive outcomes in state budgets in the past have reacted. So Aaron, let's talk to you. What's been the reaction uh, from people in and around the the after school or out of school time uh, community about this, uh, this historic investment in after school that we see in this budget? Yeah, we're seeing the providers of of out-of-school time, which is, again, before, after, and summer. We're seeing them absolutely thrilled. We're seeing parents thrilled. And youth, of course, are really excited because what this investment is going to do is make sure that more youth have an opportunity to participate in these programs. And I know, Matt, as you know, and Patrick and Ben, you know, we we have a real shortage of uh, opportunities for youth as it relates to uh, out-of-school time. And as I like to call it, we have a crisis, right, a crisis of after-school 
we do not have enough uh, opportunities for a uh, youth of where to go from 3 to 6 p.m. and during the summer. And so really this funding is going to uh, help to ensure that more youth have access to these critical programs. And so everyone is, is thrilled. And this is, as you know, Matt, this is a huge investment and having gone from, uh, what was it, two years ago, I think we had a $5 million investment to now $50 million and for it to be state dollars, it's just, uh, we were doing a jig, if you imagine. <laughs> I, I can't imagine. No, and I was a part of a lot of those conversations. It's yeah. exciting. Ben, how about from your end? I mean, your your program is a little bit different and I can't remember the last time we saw an increase in state funding uh, for you know mm -hmm. the network for youth and families and the, and the groups that you serve. So how about from your perspective? Yeah, I think our group, uh, a lot of joy and ecstatic and, uh, you know, I, we were dancing some jigs too when the news came in. And I think with a little bit of disbelief, like, can this really be happening now after all of these years? We did get a modest increase in 2019, 2020, um, but uh, it was very, very modest, like $500,000. And aside from that, it's been since the very early 2000s, I want to say 2001, since we've seen any type of substantial increase for runaway and homeless youth in the state of Michigan. So we are uh, beyond ecstatic that, uh, that this much of our ask was implemented, and we're looking forward to what comes next. Great. And Patrick, how about you? I know you've got a... Uh... A uh, committed group of, uh, of folks who have lived and died with adult ed and alternative ed here in Michigan for a long time, ridden the roller coaster, I would say, for many years. Uh, what's the feeling in the in the adult and alternative ed field with the latest budget? Yeah, I would echo the same thing that Aaron and Ben echoed from their members. Um, a couple of words that have come from our members have been, I finally now have the space to build the capacity that I've been needing for the last 20 years probably <laughs> to do my uh, programming, but also um, great enthusiasm uh, in the fact that there is now going to be investment for innovation and really allowing our professional educators to um, ideate and be able to really build the programs that are in the best interests of those that they serve. So it has been a roller coaster <laughs> for sure, especially in our adult education um, provider um, those that have been in our membership for a long time. But we're very excited, Matt, about this. And you've been integral to, uh, throughout that process too. So thank you for that. Sure. All right, Ben, let's jump back to you. So tell us really kind of what this means, what this increase uh, in funding means for real service improvements uh, for your members and the work that they do in their communities. So some of the first things we're hearing from our existing um, providers was the ability to expand into areas that maybe are a little bit underserved um, in uh, improving facilities. So a lot of these programs came about in the late 70s when uh, federal funding first became available for runaway and homeless youth. And so a lot of these programs are in very aged buildings that are crumbling and, and needing lots of support and lots of help. And the, the amount of capital that goes into a new building, not just from the standpoint of constructing or purchasing a building, but what it requires to get that building licensed and to code for uh, residential use is, is very cumbersome. And so uh, being able to create a space that is welcoming and safe and inviting for youth and families who are in crisis is so vital to many of our providers. And they're now going to have the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, seeing expansion into areas of the state that are unserved. We have 18 counties without an identified provider. And Having the having had the legislature actually use our language and and direct those funds in the way that we um, uh, suggested is is huge too because we'll be able to work with MDHHS to identify partner organizations to expand into those unserved areas for existing providers again uh, expanding not just physical infrastructure but things like technology and. Um, making it easier, you know, for, for my agency in particular, if I can implement some uh, technology that has previously been out of reach for us, it can really make things more efficient and get my staff spending a whole lot less time on paperwork and a lot more time available for the people that they're working with. 
Um, and then beyond just our runaway funding, uh, you know, uh, Aaron and Patrick's organizations here and other wins that we had in this in this budget for the state are going to have an impact on our on the youth and families that we encounter and that we work with. So it's not just our our little corner here that we're excited about, but the overall win that we see across the state. Yeah, that's great. That's important to hear as well. So, Aaron, I know you alluded to this a little bit in your first answer, but but let's talk a little bit more specifically. What does $50 million mean for after school programming in Michigan? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge investment, right? And we've done a lot of research and really been able to look at, you know, where are in terms of where are there programs across the state? Where do we need to start some up? Where are the programs that need to be invested in and supported now, right? So really what's going to happen is there's going to be, as it has previously, there'll be a competitive grant process that's going to go through the Department of Education and it will support uh, out of school time programs. So it will support and like it'll support Patrick's members, right? So community education, parks and rec, libraries, uh, ISDs, uh, 501c3, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, etc. All of those will be eligible to apply. And the funding will support, you know, actual costs, right, for youth participating in these programs. But it will also uh, cover uh, staffing if needed. It can cover program costs, curriculum costs, field trip costs, you know, all across the board, really, to ensure that the programs have what they need to to uh, do this, do this work in their communities. That's great. And Patrick, I know you alluded to this as well, but but what does specifically this investment mean for your members and for adult ed and community ed services and family literacy services across the state? Yeah, and I just want to echo to what both Ben and Aaron have said about the historic nature of this map. So, especially for our members, not only the per pupil. Uh, allocation going up that's going to help all learners across our state, but also specifically for our adult education populations, we have 10 million in ongoing investment that's that's coming in. We have a $15 million one-time uh, investment for innovation, as well as the creation of the Adult Literacy Opportunity Fund, which is a $2 million investment for nonprofits. So this is a uh, really historic in the nature of the size of the investment, the expansion of who can access these resources, what that means for the landscape. So I just think that that's probably the first and foremost, most key important takeaway from this um, entire thing. But in terms of what it means for on the ground, I would just echo exactly what Aaron and Ben have been saying, but specifically looking at expanding the types of services that we're able to offer in the way in which we're able to deliver those services. One of the things that we learned from the pandemic is that families, whether it's children learning, youth learning, adults learning, they need that flexibility in order to access resources. So that may be asynchronous learning or synchronous learning, in-seat, out-of-seat learning. Um, our programs can now adapt to that model more wholly and can be able to deliver those services more dynamically. The other piece that I would look at and to think about is actually going into the communities um, with physical locations. So many of our programs have been limited by their size and their scope and impact because they have to be tied to one physical address or one physical location. Well, now they can offer satellite sites. Now they can go into work, workspaces and offer on-site workplace literacy um, resources. And so there's an actual ability just to expand the actual presence, the name recognition of these programs within local communities. And I think that that's really going to be beneficial to so many of our Michigan citizens over the next couple of years. That's great. It's all exciting stuff. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about how we got here. So, so us four and, and those of us who, who live and work this stuff every day um, know all too well about the, the struggles and the travails of, uh, of this endeavor. And I know it's impossible to, to cover all of this in a short podcast like we're trying to do today, but let's talk a little bit about maybe what we think were some of the keys or what you think were some of the keys to, to getting to this success, to what we saw in this budget. Uh, you know, what was necessary to lay the groundwork? How long did it take? Who were some of the most uh, helpful champions that emerged uh, in this effort in, um, in, in pushing this case? So Aaron, let's start with you. I know that there's a lot to unpack here, but what are a couple of thoughts that you could give uh, to, to other advocates that might be out there listening to this that are saying, man, when, when's our win coming? 
Right. Well, first of all, you know, mask has been around for about 20 years. So there has been that uh, kind of perpetual drumbeat, if you will, in terms of talking about uh, the importance of out of school time. But two years ago, the uh, leadership team of MAST uh, embarked on a new strategic plan and the new strategic plan really emphasized policy work. And uh, so what we've done and, and I look at advocacy as a three legged stool. Right. So you've got your grassroots, you've got your direct and you've got your media. So we we really hunt our hats, uh, our hat on those three. And with grassroots, as you know, Matt, Michigan's Children has been super instrumental with this. We've had our weekly strategy uh, calls, and that's with, uh, as I like to call them, the grass tops, movers and shakers, right? So like Michigan's Children's, uh, the Michigan Libraries Association, Parks and Rec Association, Patrick, uh, the Wise, Boys and Girls Club, et cetera, school groups um, that are really helping to think, okay, how do we get over the finish line, right? How do we get additional dollars to support out of school time? And initially it was, how do we get even any dollars, right? To support with that 5 million and then how do we grow it knowing that it's not enough? And so that group has been really instrumental. The second piece with grassroots that's been really important is really engaging the programs, right? So we've engaged the program staff um, and some with the parents as well as youth. And, uh, you know, we've arranged meetings with uh, targeted legislators. So legislators who are instrumental in the appropriations process, right? Targeted meetings with them initially via Zoom, but then uh, in person and in person visits to the program. It's one thing for them to hear about uh, out of school time. It's another thing for any program for them to actually visit it. And that's actually how we ended up with our first champion, right? A couple of years ago, uh, representative who's now Senator Thomas Albert, who was then the House Appropriations Chair. And he really became our first hardcore champion. And the reason he became our hardcore champion is because he visited a Y program in his district and just fell in love with it. Right. And then he became the guy who started talking about out of school time, which was great. And then we already had the governor on board, of course, too. Right. Because she was supportive of out of school time. So it immediately became a bipartisan type issue. Right. So that's the grassroots. The direct piece is, you know, we've contracted with a government relations firm. Right. Having those one on one meetings with those appropriations members, as well as leadership within the legislature, the state budget office and the governor's office. So really having that direct work and having, you know, frankly, the research that's needed to talk about it, right? So about two years ago, we did and have continued to do research to talk about, you know, so where are the programs? And then also to be able to show a ratio of youth to provider that's been really, really useful for us because we're able to show what a shortage we have of programs. And then with media, obviously, we've provided the talking points and the necessary materials that all of our partners need, but then also worked really closely to get op-eds and uh, media interviews, et cetera, that help, again, to fuel and continue the emphasis and the noise around Lansing and around the state about the importance of out-of-school time. So really that three-legged stool, grassroots, direct, and media is really where we, you know, have focused and will continue to focus. Thanks, Darren. No, that's that's a great summary, really, of, of just kind of a, a snapshot of all that goes into something like this for a big effort like, like after school. Ben, let's pivot to you with, with you know, in a somewhat different approach, obviously, a smaller um, group in a, in a not as high a profile, I guess, of an issue area, but uh, certainly success nonetheless. And so what are some of the lessons that you have for folks about, uh, you know, what it took to actually get this increased funding across the finish line? Yeah, so we've been uh, in in my entire time now, 16 or 17 years or so in working with runaway and homeless youth, we've been working on this issue for that whole time. A number of years ago, we did get connected with somebody at MDHHS who was very helpful in, in helping us realize that our timeline wasn't exactly great and how we were doing it. And we really, we've had an advocacy day at the Capitol for years, but it was really a one day, a one week event where we focused all our energy on that and we didn't keep that contact and that momentum moving. I would say the the most instrumental traction we began to feel was getting connected with your staff at Michigan's Children. Um, I think Michelle made the the uh, Michelle Corey made the initial contact with one of our board members several years ago and, and got the wheels turning and um, the guidance and the assistance and the support that we've received from your staff has been astounding in getting this off the ground and getting it moving and getting all of the things that Aaron said. I won't repeat those because it's a lot of the same things, but 
getting in front of the right committees and the right people and getting those meetings and getting those out and and making those connections wherever you can. So I, you know, I don't know how much credit I can hold, but I did run into a former colleague in Costco who happens to be the neighbor of a key person on the appropriations committee and was friends with that person. So uh, I put a little few little bugs in her ear and said, hey, if this comes up, just let her know this is what we're working on. Um, so I think it is the more that they can hear from us, the more that our our voice can be heard uh, has helped get this hurdle and get it over. And I don't think we could go through this without acknowledging the vast change in our legislative makeup that we've had in the last year and the the efforts that completely unrelated to us. And I know some people who worked on the voters, not politicians. Uh, drive a couple years ago that got the redistricting on the ballot that enabled us to have this new fresh legislature that is listening to us and, and feel that our voices are being heard in a, in a way that some of the previous members were not. So um, it, all of those things coming together um, have really created some momentum and we're again looking forward to what comes next. No, thanks. Thanks, Ben. And no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I certainly appreciate hearing that about Michigan's children. I mean, that's truly what we want to be as an organization is, is we want to be a resource and a help uh, to anybody who cares about kids and families in Michigan. But, but partners like you all on this on this recording today or on this podcast today are, are great examples of, of some of the wonderful organizations we get to work with. Uh, and, and from time, time to time, see some success with. So that's great. So Patrick, let's pivot to you now. And, and Ben mentioned the, the election, and I think rightfully so. I mean, obviously, we had a change in the, in the majority and the leadership in the, elect, in the legislature, um, which created a lot more opportunity for a lot of us. But also, even apart from that, you know, we've done a lot of work with McKay around the elections and even just bringing these issues to the forefront to candidates even before they're elected and starting to build really this effort, uh, you know, with these folks, even while they're still running for office or before they're actually serving in the legislature. Uh, so talk from your perspective about, you know, some of these things that, that have been going on for a long time that helped lead us to this position we're in now. Yeah, Matt, um, a lot of people are saying that this is a values budget this year, you know, that, that this budget really exemplifies what the values are for the state. So about 18 to 24 months ago, it's so interesting, kind of Aaron's time frame as well, of, of internally within the organization looking at this. About 18 to 24 months ago, we had a values conversation about how is our messaging getting across? We've been advocating for some of these issues for a very long time. And what has been the result of that? Doesn't mean that people haven't put in some hard work, but the, our message maybe isn't meeting the people that it needs to, and it's not really moving in the way that we needed to. So we kind of had a reevaluation piece um, in Michigan's Children was integral in that of kind of saying, wake up, <laughs> where are we at in the world? What values do you have as an organization? What do your members want to get across? And so over the last two years, we've held a number of candidate forums, um, working with Michigan children and student speak events, which have allowed us to invite policymakers from both sides of the aisle into our programs to hear directly from providers. And a lot of times we've left um, just that as an opportunity for engagement. And we haven't always pushed a policy point directly tied to that. Um, we kind of wait maybe and let that sink in and let that good experience kind of happen. But the whole point has been to identify what the values are at the local level to those policymakers. This is something that is good for your community. <laughs> Coming, having a program or having a space within the community that offers before and after school, youth programming or adult skill building is a value to your community. And here's why. And here are some stories that can support that. Um, that putting that time and effort into doing those types of events has made it a lot easier in the last six to 12 months when we've had to have the more specific policy level conversations about what does this mean? What is the cost that's associated with this? What's the direct impact that we're going to have? And when we've had those conversations, then when we started to pivot to having conversations with the executive office or with um, the Democratic caucus or the Republican caucus on the other side of the aisle, people recognized the value. They were able to identify, yes, I attended that event, or I had a staff member that went to that event, and, and yes, I heard good things. I Yes, I actually can get on a board to support kind of from a 30,000 level what, this, um, what your platform is and what these issues are. So putting in that legwork, I think, was really integral in 
we, we've done a lot of events, Matt, that are like statewide events, and that's so really important, but being more strategic about the regional and identifying who some champions are at a regional level or, you know, individual district levels of where do you have a, a hot pocket where we can tie into kind of some themes that are happening. Um, that, that strategy and taking a step back and identifying those key folks uh, was very integral and important, I think, in, in the bigger landscape. Yeah, that's great. Well, these are all great lessons that, that advocates across the, any issue area relating to kids and families uh, can take from you guys' responses today and, and, and some of the you know effort that went into to seeing this success, I think, is something that we certainly at Michigan's Children will continue to build on, and I know you, you all will for, with your organizations as well. So uh, before we conclude here, let's just uh, give you, I'll give you each an opportunity to kind of jump in on that and what's next. Uh, you know, one of the challenges with the work that we do as advocates for these things is that it never ends, right? Uh, even after uh, some, you know, significant success like this, um, the, there's certainly there's barely a minute to, to pause and, and celebrate. And then you're right back on to what's next or defending this or, or what may have it. So, so, Ben, let's start with you. What do you see and what's next for the Michigan Network for Youth and Families? Um, well, I think our first is just figuring out the logistics with our partners at MDHHS on what this is going to look like, how it's going to roll out, which I expect we'll have some answers on that in the next week or so. Just the timing of our, our contracts usually come out this time of year. We're also looking at, you know, other opportunities and continuing our work with our advocacy committee that, again, Michigan's Children has been instrumental in helping us uh, get going to really mobilize our members and, and help all of the staff within all of the providers feel that they have an opportunity to get involved and make a difference. And I um, I don't think I can stress how much that's had an impact on, on these outcomes for us as well. Um, Bobby's been instrumental in helping us get that moving and, and keep that moving and keep the momentum going. So we're looking at some opportunities to draw attention to the mental health needs of the families that we're serving and looking at some specific outcomes for um, for those youth and families and some of the barriers that are in our way for achieving those outcomes and hopefully um, can come back with some policy recommendations on how to change that in the future. And then, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll leave it there. No, that's, I could keep talking, but <laughs> I'll let the others go. <laughs> No, that's great. And and Aaron, we'll jump to you quickly here. No, I know $50 million is a great win, but but I know we all have bigger goals than that. Uh, so how do we keep this momentum going for the out-of-school time community? Yeah, never enough, right? Uh, so yeah, no, and right now, I think what we're really looking at doing is, you know, we want to make sure that it's a, a great grant process, right, this next time around for the 50 million. And so uh, we have right now, we're recruiting for a, it's called a Michigan Out of School Time Advisory Committee, and that was required to be created uh, in the appropriations language. And it's really going to be an opportunity for us to hear from uh, the field, to hear from providers, parents, youth, other organizations that are partners in out of school time to really help shape not only this grant process this time around, but then also talking about what should this look like in the future, right? What should the system statewide of out of school time look like in Michigan? And Matt, as you know, uh, out of school time will be moving, right, from uh, the Department of Ed over into the new state department, uh, my leap, right? So we'll uh, be working really closely with the uh, governor's office and MDE to, you know, ensure that transition and then also to uh, ensure that it continues to maintain, be, make, continue to be a priority, right, for uh, the governor's office as well as for uh, our legislative champions. So in other words, we want to see great use with these dollars, but then we want to push for more for next budget season. <laughs> That's right. It never ends. All right, Patrick, how about from a case standpoint? Yeah, we're we're doing the same. Really, it's yeah. there's no rest for the weary, right? I mean, we just keep uh, marching along, but really, we're we have three phases: really, the planning, programming, and then our storytelling. So, planning, we're doing the same phase as Ben and Aaron are working with the Department of Education, Department of 
LEO, Labor and Economic Opportunity. What does this mean? What are the logistics of it, the administration, the timelines of RFPs and grants and all of that lingo? We, we're in that planning phase right now, but we're also in the programming phase of how do we help our members and our providers across the state utilize uh, these resources in strategic ways. Some are going to see significant increases in their funding allocations. And so what are the national trends? What are the statewide trends that they should be prioritizing or investing in? What goals do they have? Helping them set those realistic kind of vision pieces. Um, we've got some tools and some work group meetings uh, as the summer comes to a close that we'll be launching to help facilitate those conversations. And then the storytelling piece, I think, you know, as Aaron was talking about, we want to frame this for next year already. What does this mean? What does the impact mean as a thank you, not only to the executive office and the legislature and the other citizens of Michigan that um, are the tax bank citizens, but what does this investment mean, even though we're just starting out and we're not going to see some of the real implications for a little while, but what is this going to mean at the local level? What is it going to mean at the statewide level? We need to start capturing those stories. So we're kind of already planning and thinking ahead for what that looks like, um, both in the next few months, but also six to 12, 18 months from now as well. Um, how do we uh, parlay that the resources we have need to be maintained, but also what could the future investments look like as well? Great. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, but I really want to thank our friends, Ben, Patrick, and Aaron for this great conversation, and certainly thank them and appreciate all the hard work that they've done in bringing about these positive changes on behalf of kids and families here in Michigan. And I want to thank everyone who's listening to this and for watching our podcast on YouTube. Please be sure to share this program with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep this going and share this information as widely as possible. And for more in-depth information on the state budget, both wins and missed opportunities, look for our latest State Budget Basics report on our website at Michigan's children.org under the resources tab. As always, you can go to our podcast page under the resources tab to listen to this program again and to find any additional info that you may have missed the first time. Thank you and take care, everybody. You've been listening to Speaking for Kids, the podcast for Michigan's children with host Matt Gillard. Thanks for joining us. To explore these and other issues relevant to our state's children, youth, and families, and to build your advocacy muscle, go to our website at www.michiganschildren.org. You'll find links and news about past and future podcast topics under our resource tab and action alerts under the Take Action tab. Find and like us on Facebook and Twitter. Terry Bannis and Stephen Wallace produced this podcast. Contact them with your questions and ideas for other topics. Michigan's Children is a nonprofit advocacy organization, an independent voice working to reduce disparities in child outcomes from cradle to career through policy change.